Everyone, good evening. Thank you for being here tonight. Shalom and welcome. Welcome to tonight's program entitled Changing the Game in Commemoration of Kristallnacht. Tonight's program is in partnership with the USC Shoah Foundation, the Jewish Federation in the Heart of New Jersey, and with the Maimonides Institute for Medicine, Ethics, and the Holocaust. On the evening of, of November 9th, 1938, Nazi leaders unleashed a series of pogroms against the Jewish population. This event came to be called Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, because of the shattered glass that littered the streets after the vandalism and destruction of Jewish-owned businesses, synagogues, and homes. Many scholars consider this event to be the start of the Holocaust. I invite our panelists to each light a candle, honoring the memories of those who lost their lives at the hands of the Nazis. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists for tonight's program. Graham Honecker and Jerry Logan are the authors of the Cinderella Strategy and their brand new release called Unbracketed, Big Time College Basketball Done the Right Way. So we're going to hear from them tonight and about this fabulous new book. We also have Dr. Amanda Caleb the Professor of Medical Humanities at Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine and Educational Consultant at the Maimonides Institute for Medicine, Ethics, and the Holocaust. We are honored to have with us Coach Bob McKillop, the very recently retired head coach of Davidson College Men's Basketball and the inaugural leader in residence. And finally, we have Dr. Stacy Gallen, the founding director of the Maimonides Institute for medicine, ethics, and the Holocaust. Everyone, let's welcome all of our panelists tonight. Okay, so our first question, uh, Graham and Jerry, is for you. Your book is called Unbracketed, Big Time College Basketball Done the Right Way. Guys, I'm wondering, why did you write this book? Well, first of all, I'd say it's a, it's a great honor for us to be here. We, uh, we had the good fortune of writing our first book three years ago on Butler University, uh, where I work, and uh, Jerry had done a dissertation at Boston College on how athletics can elevate a university. And we collaborated. The book did really well. Um, I like to say my mom bought quite a few copies. Uh, so <laughs> the, uh, the publisher was really happy with it, and, and they said, you know, if you want to take a shot at another project, uh, you know, go for it. And... I think a big motivation for Jerry and I, and I'll let him speak, is you read and you hear so much bad in athletics about, you know, corruption and cheating and, 
and, and certainly that's out there, but we really believed um, there were so many good stories to tell. And fortunately, we had connections to Davidson, Gonzaga, to Villanova, to Loyola of Chicago. And, um, and he said, why don't we take a stab at this and, and showcase these stories, which, you know, the most powerful is the, um, we'll get into it, but the Davidson trip to Auschwitz. So we really wanted to shine light on, on the good in college athletics that we still believe exist. exist. You want to add on to that? Sure, I'd just add that um, <clears throat> I grew up playing basketball. I played in high school. My coach was also my AP English teacher. I played in college, Division three. My coach taught a freshman seminar. The idea that athletics and academics could fit together always made sense to me. So trying to find how that worked at the highest levels, both athletically and academically, was part of this process for me. And believing that it could on, on the biggest stages and on the grandest scales, still work together um, was a big motivation for me um, in chasing down a lot of these stories. Okay. Coach McKillop. Um, everyone, in Coach McKillop, we have uh, a boy from Queens. So, Coach, tell us, how did a New Yorker wind up spending three decades in a small town, Davidson, North Carolina? I think New York is the Holy Land. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Woo -hoo. Uh, when uh, we lived in South Oswald Park in Queens, and my father was a New York City cop, and my mother dropped out of high school as a sophomore, so she was a homemaker. In 1962, Bob Wagner was the mayor of New York City, and Bob Wagner said cops and firemen no longer had to live within the five boroughs. So we picked up our suitcases and moved to Long Island. And during the time our house was being sold, we lived in this attached house in South Ozone Park. I would take the for sale sign and put it behind the hedges so that no one could see our house was for sale. And then when clients came in to buy the house, I would tell them the toilet backs up, <laughs> the heat doesn't work. And I was only 11 years old and I tried everything to stay in Queens. And for some reason, it's never gotten out of my blood. Anyway, I, I go to college, and uh, the reason I went to college was because a legendary high school coach in, in Briarwood, Queens, named Jack Curran of Archbishop Malloy High School, made a phone call for me. He wasn't even my high school coach, but he made a phone call for me, and sight unseen, they offered me his full scholarship to East Carolina University. Now, this is 1967. I have no idea where East Carolina is. Right. Which state is it in? Is it another state I maybe don't know about? <laughs> and um, Eastern North Carolina in 1967, let me tell you, if you're a guy from Queens, New York, you want to stay out of there. <laughs> uh, it was a rather interesting environment to be in. But during the time I was there, they were in the same conference as Davidson. And Davidson was top 10 in the country during that time period. Mm -hmm. Two. Uh twice during the decade of the 60s, Davidson was top 10. So I knew how good they were. I'd become a high school coach and a high school administrator and uh, had this yearning that there was something more out there. And I was fortunate to, to make the leap from being a head high school coach to a division one head coach in 1989. And the place that offered me that opportunity was Davidson College, the head coach of Virginia was the guy who hired me. His name is Terry Holland. He was the coach of Ralph Sampson and the Virginia trip to the Final Four in the early 80s. And he told me, if you come to Davidson, I'll become the athletic director. And he lived up to that commitment to me and, and was a terrific mentor for me. But that's the reason why I wound up at Davidson, a place that has great academics and a beautiful small college town, but a great tradition of success from the 60s when I was a player. Thanks, Coach. I have a follow-up question for you. Um, in just a few moments, we're going to watch this very powerful video. Uh, and you say in the video that you wanted to help your players at Davidson become leaders. And in and of itself, that is such a great thing because you're the kind of coach that it's not solely about wins and losses. You really wanted to build character um, in the young men that, that you were coaching and that you do coach. Now, Coach, I just have to ask, you know, there are a lot of ways to build character. You know, you could go on a retreat, you could do a few trust falls. Why 
why did you choose to take your players on a tour of Auschwitz? And doctors uh, Caleb and uh, Gallen, if you want to, you know, chime in on that, you're welcome to as well. Go ahead. You can go first. <laughs> Four years prior to our trip, I had been to Auschwitz on another trip, and um, I, I saw the horrors firsthand. I was a history major and a history teacher in my young years as a coach, so I knew history. I watched movies, but when you see it up close, the stark reality of what happened is uh, of such a horrific nature you, you have to search more. And lo and behold, a couple of years later, Amanda calls me and asks me if we'd like to take our team. And it was in July, and it was going to be escorted by Eva Moses Kaur, who was one of the Mengele twins. And to have this opportunity, not just to read in a history book, watch in a movie, look at the various aspects of Auschwitz and Birkenau, but to have this woman give us her feelings about it, to stand on the selection platform and describe in great detail the cement that she remembers from 1943 when she was a 10-year-old kid, for her to give you a descriptive picture of her standing as that train door opened up and it was her and her sister Miriam holding hands and her mother and father and I think it was another sister and maybe brother and be forced down with the barking dogs and the shouting and the screaming and the guns. For her to describe that in the incredible depth of her detail and, and still be able to do that with with honor and integrity and respect as a human being for the fact that now she was representing honor and integrity and respect. It was the most uh, life-changing experience I have ever had. And she walked us to the exact path that she took as the Soviets freed the prisoners, the, the Jewish people, and she told us she had to do that several times because the Soviets were filming it. And they wanted a better film than the first time. And there she is hand in hand as a 10 year old girl in that disgusting striped outfit. After the brutality of what she experienced and being able to walk on that same pathway. And our players, our team held an umbrella for her because of the sun, walked hand in hand with her and the life change occurred right there for every player in our program. And I think we all aspire to be leaders. I think that's what we want, but something gets in the way. Our pride, our selfishness, something else. Well, uh, pride and selfishness doesn't get in the way of that kind of leadership when you have young men leave that experience and then become uh, carriers of that message because that message needs to continue what was done there, that it never happens again. I mean, thank you, Coach. Um, Dr. Gallen, before we watch the video, do you want to tell us just a little bit more about Eva Moses Kaur, this incredible, this incredible woman? Um, when I met Eva, the first, oh, first of all, I just want to say, uh, I'm sorry that Eva's son, Alex, can't be with us tonight. Um, but I know that I heard from Alex earlier and I know that he wishes that he were here and I know that he's watching at home. So, um, and he's continuing the important work um, that his mom did. So I just uh, want to acknowledge Alex. And um, the first night that I met Eva, Amanda, Amanda was there. Um, I made Eva a promise and I told her that I would continue to tell her story and that I would make sure that the world knew her story um, and I took that promise very seriously and I continue to take that promise very seriously um, and that's the reason why I'm here today um, 
Eva was a friend, a mentor, an inspiration. She was everything that Coach McKillop said she was. She embodied forgiveness. She embodied leadership, um, all of those wonderful things. Um, but I also just want to say that um, all the people on this stage right now also embody those things because it's, it's very easy for me to sit here as a Jew, um, as someone whose son was here two days ago becoming a bar mitzvah. Um, it's very easy for me to understand the importance of being here. To have these people, um, and I apologize for revealing uh, you know, uh, personal information about you, but to have all of these people here with me on this stage, on this bima, none of whom are Jewish, but all of whom understand the importance of telling the story, understand the importance of sharing Eva's story. None of them hesitated when I asked them to be here today, not, not one of them. And I think that it's important to note, um, when you said that Coach McKillop recently retired, Coach McKillop coached the Davidson team, 30 years? 30 years? 33. 33 years. <laughs> 33 years. Get it right. Sorry, 33 years. Um, do the math. Do the math, I know, right? I'm really old. <laughs> um, coach, Mc this is, coach, the current coach of Davidson's basketball team is Coach McKillop's son, Matt McKillop, who is a wonderful individual uh, who was with us on the trip. Tonight is Davidson's first basketball game that Coach McKillop is not there for and his son is coaching. He is here with us instead. He is honoring his commitment. He is honoring his promise because he feels that this is that important. And I think that is worth mentioning. And I think, honestly, I mean, you've got some special individuals here that make me feel a lot better about the state of the world right now and that make me feel a lot better um, about making sure that we're going to be able to um, carry on Eva's legacy. So I just thought that that was worth mentioning. All right, terrific. Thank you, Dr. Gallen. So let's, let's watch this incredible video of the Davidson basketball team, their experience at Auschwitz. Why did you choose to come on this trip? Why did you choose to come on this trip? Why did you choose to come on this trip? To see. I'm forever challenged by the quest to turn our players into leaders, to help them become better leaders. And what a tremendous opportunity to um, gain a tremendous perspective on an historical event that, in my judgment, is probably the most horrific event in uh, the history of man. Uh, and to see how they can become the um, leaders in their generation of living the message that uh, this can't happen again. When Coach first came to you with the idea of spending part of your summer break 
in Auschwitz? What was your first reaction? Uh, personally, I was extremely excited. Um, just knowing that we were going to be given the opportunity to take um, such a unique trip as a group of guys and just get to continue to strengthen our bond whilst learning about um, what probably the most heinous period of history um, in the world um, and just knowing that we were going to have an opportunity to grow as people to see such an incredible example um, through Eva and her story um, we were all filled with excitement and personally as a person who's always wanting to just become you know more wiser and, and, and filled with wisdom and hopefully being able to give back um, eventually I was extremely excited at the opportunity I was excited at the opportunity um, I was also scared but I was intrigued because I've heard stories about um, what went on during the Holocaust, but I never um, imagined getting a personal look at what actually took place. We've spent the day today and we'll spend the day tomorrow remembering the past and everything that took place here. And now it's our turn to give a gift back. It's our turn to do something. It's our turn to protect the future. We need to take care of each other. We're all different, but we share one thing in common. We're all members of humankind. And as members of humankind, we owe it to one another. We owe it to the people who lost their lives here. We owe it to the future to care for each other, to show respect, to show human dignity, and to never let something like this ever happen again. Our two greatest gifts are time and love, and we don't have a lot of time here on this earth, but I feel that if we like it's in human nature to, you know, to hate and be selfish and want everything to yourself. But I feel that if we um, try to fight that, combat that, make a conscious effort to, you know, um, embrace people and love others um, with this short time that we do have on this earth, I really think that will go a, go a long way. We talked about it and also Pat and I were talking about it a lot. Um, just trying to, to wrap our minds around like how it was possible, this question, how, how could you possibly wake up in the morning and do this to people? Um, and it's that exact idea which you guys were all saying, um, which is that they, they dehumanize them. Um, but something I was really thinking about is, I, I was talking about, what, like in my opinion, what makes us humans is our ability to, to empathize, which, uh, to me seems like something, and this may be naive, but something that, that's almost impossible to get rid of. Uh, just because even when you, when you look at like an, an animal, like it, your dog, like when your dog gets hurt, if you were to hurt your dog, like try to harm your dog, you, you would feel guilty, you'd feel something inside. And it, 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 it's shocking to me that um, the, the dehumanizing was, was so strong amongst the Nazis that they were able to do this to all these people. Like, not one person, not like 15 people, but like millions of people over this short amount of time. And, and in a way, they, they became less human themselves in doing that, in my opinion. Uh, because they, they rid of all, all sense of empathy, all sense of care, uh, which is so important to like, how, how we are as people.
when you talk about who's in your circle or not in your circle is people that have different beliefs than you or disagree you disagree with what they believe in or what they represent and and does that push them to such a point that you can't think of them as a person anymore you know i think that's something we're really struggling in the u.s and um that's as i've walked around just the way that people were treated during the Holocaust. It's just, it, it, if, if we are people of faith and there's all different flavors of faith, but if our world and our country, you know, thinks that we're people of faith, well, the first thing is, you know, there's a higher power, but then the second thing is because of that, how do we treat other people? Golden rule, um, what you do to the least of my brothers, you do unto me. I mean, you're, you know, you're, you're higher, you know, you're God. Um, this everything that we've watched today and yesterday and thought about for the last couple of weeks it totally goes against that i think another way people we can help each other is by um talking to different people people we're not um familiar with um i think in today's world and in the past um people have been afraid to um stretch out and like talk to other people they're not familiar with and um as we've seen as horrific effects um it's important that we take a step back and realize that uh, the world doesn't revolve around us. Mm -hmm. And um, it, I think it's difficult to uh, interact with everyone or learn about everyone's problem, but um, we tend to generalize people and put a bunch of people into this same group. But I think it's important that we put ourselves in uh, went through just based off of their religion who they were and, and just the, the horror they went through um, you know I think it just gives us a much deeper appreciation for for what we have and it, it adds a different perspective I, I actually do you, can I read something please, wrote, please do um, because I was reflecting on it and this was day one, and as I've been walking around today, I've just been thinking how much more it actually applies here. Um, I wrote, Here there is an objective beauty. The light, the sky, the grass, from afar even some of the structures. It is painful. The more I think of it, the more I feel as a metaphor. The camp today means something different than it used to mean. Maybe it's despite that. Today, it means survival, triumph, mourning, the other side of the mountain of forgiveness that Eva talks about. But that's today. Today's another beautiful day. Maybe tomorrow it storms, and maybe tomorrow we feel differently about what we remember here. Um, but I, I felt like having Eva here especially, like even on what she calls like hell on earth, to be able to find beauty, um, I think is, is part, is a metaphor for what her message really is. most memorable part um, was probably just the scariest part hearing about the fact that they were so efficient and so heartless in the killing because to me that showed the actual cruelty that they had because they just went about it as if it was daily business. At some points it was hard for me to really like put myself like um, in what was actually going on because it just everything just seemed so horrific it just seemed 
not real, but seeing the hair really like was kind of surreal for me. And I, I honestly got really sick when I, when I saw it. I got really nauseous and I felt like everything. I feel that feel that way right now. I'd say walking in the gas chamber in Auschwitz one. Um, we walked in to the right, and then it's a not a very high ceiling. It's a pretty long probably like 50, 60 feet, and then you look up and you see the places where they drop the, the Ziklon B, the gas, into the chambers, and that's a view that thousands of people had. Um, maybe one of the last things they saw, and being able to seeing that was, I didn't, I didn't really know what to think at first, but then I kind of just, it hasn't really hit me yet, but I just think that it's just a sick, it's awful. I mean, it's sick, like that happened to people. And um, walking through that was, it was tough. And um, I think it's really important. That's another reason I came on the trip to learn more about it. And so like no more people have to really see that and go through that. And I, you know, I can never put myself in the shoes of any of the people who went through what they went through, but when you see the shirt that's the same size of what my daughter wears, it's unbelievable. And uh, it's horrific. I knew that this trip would change the lives of the team, but I didn't realize how much it would change for me and what an impact it would have on me. Um, and I consider myself incredibly lucky to have had this experience. Thank you to Eva for sharing her story and thank you to the Davidson basketball players and coaches for coming with us and for your willingness to reflect upon the past, um, to protect the future, and to make sure what we saw these last three days never happens again. So thank you. I always say when, I, when I'm 40 at the dinner table, I want to be able to talk about other things besides basketball. To realize that we have the opportunity to go and learn and not even touch a basketball. It's completely a bonding experience in itself when we're traveling, when we're together, and it's also an educational experience. And, and like I mentioned before, it's a reminder um, of what should be important, and that's you know the respect of all people. I think as young people who have the potential to be the next leaders, it's, it's up to us at this point to make sure that we create the world that we see fit and in an equal world that's very inclusive. It's so important to learn from something that was so tragic to make sure that it never happens again and that we would be the voices of humanity and of human dignity that would prevent anything like that from happening again. Right. Thanks to our friends at the Maimonides Institute, we have the experience to learn firsthand about injustice and genocide. To be left All right, the panelists are going to come back up and we're going to continue our discussion, especially about the video. Okay, so I hope everyone uh, was moved by the video. It is so powerful. 
You know, especially I was moved by the scene in which uh, Eva Moses Kor is walking with the team at Auschwitz. It's such a great scene. I mean, you have these, you know, these huge young men are walking with this tiny little woman, and at one point, you know, she holds out her hand, and one of the players takes her hand, and then uh, Kellen Grady, one of the players, is sort of stooped over, like, you know, pushing her walker along. It is just so beautiful and powerful. Uh, she seems like such an inspiring human being. Um, can you just, you know, tell us what it was like to be her coach or Dr. Caleb, Dr. Gallen, tell us about Eva Moses Corps and what it was like. How does a woman have the capacity to smile in that environment after what she had been through? Uh, for her to say that she forgives what a message that was to our players that she was offering forgiveness. And it wasn't as if it was something that was not memorable. She lost her parents. She lost her sister. She had her youth destroyed, taken from her. And then she watched and witnessed everything else that was done to Jewish people for no reason. So I, I think she's one of the most, she's a hero to me, one of the most extraordinary people I've ever met in my life. Um, when I first met Eva and she told me about her message of forgiveness, I, I had a hard time imagining how you could forgive. Um, I really struggled with that. And, and hearing her speak and spending time with her, I thought about how empowering she was, um, not only for herself, for other survivors, but for for the youth more broadly. There's some wonderful stories of her working with teens who've come from um, abusive situations um, and how her message of forgiveness has really helped them. And I think that's so extraordinary how much she, she gave back. Um, you know, she faced a lot of opposition when she raised um, awareness about the Holocaust, when she pushed back against political leaders in particular, in particular um, and, and against a lot of adversity in opening her museum in Indiana, um, including facing anti-Semitism. Um, the museum was burned, burned to the ground, um, and she rebuilt. And, and I think that's something extraordinary to me, um, is, is just, she was a force. That's the only word I can use to describe her. She was an absolute force. Um, and she was also quite joyful. And that's something I think back to is, is for me, it was my first time being in Auschwitz, um, and I'd spent five days there before the team arrived with her uh, museum with candles. So I, I had spent a total of, um, I guess, six days between Birkenau and Auschwitz, which was a lot. And um, how she had joy in Auschwitz one, and I, and I couldn't understand that until she kept saying, this is where I was liberated. And for her, it was different from Birkenau. Birkenau was incarceration, Auschwitz was was liberation. And, and so the fact that she could be you know, so inspiring, but also could have build this relationship with the players. Um, and, and just, I mean, some of the comments she had, the way she was building um, that camaraderie, that, that mentorship. I remember Nelson, um, one of the players in the film, she said, put your foot out. And she puts her foot next to his, and his foot is, I don't know, size 14, size large. And, and hers is- It was extra large. Extra large, sure and hers is probably a size, it was size four. And she put it out and she said, it's close, it's close. Um, and, you know, it was just so joyful. I mean, there was that about connecting to the players um, that I, I really enjoyed about Eva. And it was funny, on, when I left my house this morning, um, my kids, before I left, I told them where I was going. And my son said, take some M&Ms and meet on the car ride, because that was one of Eva's favorite yep. candies. Um, I couldn't quite bring myself to stop and get McDonald's chicken nuggets. Yes. That's her other favorite. I couldn't quite bring myself. But I think that that's who Eva was. There was such... Um, you know, joy and empowerment and, and just fighting that good fight day in and day out. Um, I just think of how much strength she had to have and how inspiring that was to be in her presence. And that's why you see what you see with, with the team, right? Like that's why you see how they supported her and she put her hand out and they grabbed it um, because she had a way of connecting with them she had a way of connecting with everyone that she spoke to. And I think, to me, that was an inspiration for the work that I do. Um, because I think the Holocaust is taught, um, 
we have at least one person in here in the back uh, who's in eighth, eighth grade and has heard me say this before. The Holocaust is often taught in a way that doesn't resonate with the next generation, right? Like it doesn't connect with them. It's taught as history um, and it's taught as something that happened to people who aren't here anymore um, or something that doesn't matter. Um, but it's hard to connect. How do you, con how do you make that connection? Um, you know, like a lot of kids now that we're talking to, like they weren't alive when 9-11 happened, right. you know? So how do you make this relevant to them? She made it relevant to everybody that she spoke to. And so for me, when I say that I'm going to continue her legacy, that's the legacy, right? Is how do you make it relevant? How do you make it important? How do you make it something that matters? How do you remember the past to protect the future? And it's that kind of outside the box, um, how do you make people understand that? And I think the idea is that we're all members of humankind that deserve to be treated with dignity and respect, but that means that we all have a responsibility to treat other people with dignity and respect. And it's not about the idea of there was a horrible thing that happened and let's only focus on the negative. It's about what lessons can we learn and how do we move forward with that, which is why I think the book is such an amazing thing. Um, and using this story as the foundation for the book is so great. I, so I'm, I echo uh, Coach McKillop. Uh, Eva Kaur is, is probably my all-time hero. And I, I knew Eva for a long time. Her son is one of my best friends. Her son went to Butler University. And we brought Eva to speak at our commencement in 2015. And I highly encourage you to watch her, the YouTube video of that. It was the most powerful commencement speech that I've ever heard, but she, um, we play basketball in Hinkle Fieldhouse, which is a relatively famous stadium. If you've seen the movie Hoosiers, uh, it was filmed there. And I've been to a lot of great games there, but my favorite moment was at the end of her commencement speech. Uh, she said, when, now to the graduates, when you go home today, I want you to give your mom and dad a hug, not only to thank them for getting you through college, but I never had the chance to do that when I left Auschwitz. And she then invited her son, Alex, to come up on stage and embraced him. And the, the ovation and the roar was, it's a moment I'll never forget. And then one last antidote, I was traveling, I travel quite often for my work and I was traveling, I think I was coming here about six years ago. And it was one of those 6 a.m. flights where you've gotta get up at 4 a.m. And I was kind of feeling sorry for myself and grouchy and moody. And I'm going through security and Eva Kaur is being wheeled through security at 6 a.m. because she was going to give a lecture at Baruch College in Brooklyn. And to your point about how she fought the fight, she was probably 80 years old at that time and she was still going around the world making 100, 110 speeches um, per year on, on her experiences wow. with the Holocaust. Just really an incredible person. Yeah, and just preaching a message of to not to not stay anchored in the anger and the bitterness and the past, but to to acknowledge that it happened and learn the lessons, but also to move forward. And that's what Candles is all about, her foundation. Um, just amazing. And she really did inspire the players. Um, in the book, in the introduction, um, when you talked about, you know, one of the players' reactions, um, uh, he's a uh, coach who was one of your guards, uh, David Serapowitz. I hope I'm pronouncing it. Sharapovich. Sharapovich. Um, he wrote, every time I go through some kind of adversity, I'll think of Eva and say, if she could go through four years in Auschwitz, I can get through this. So she really, like you said, she really made a connection and an impact on these, on these players. Just incredible. Um, we watch the players in the video really struggle with the horror that they that they were that they were seeing it at Auschwitz and at Birkenau, and they spoke with such passion, so beautifully. Um, sadly, in our world today, it is still all too common for people to see the other as the enemy and to label them as such. Um, and I couldn't, I was thinking about the video and thinking about the state of our world today. And I was thinking about in the Hebrew scriptures, um, we have what we call commandments or in Hebrew mitzvot. 
And there are 613 of them in the five books of Moses. And the one that is by far the most common um, is not a ritualistic one. It's not about observing the Sabbath or holidays. It's not about keep, keeping kosher. By far the most common commandment that God commands the Israelites, it appears 36 times in through the five books of Moses, is to have compassion for the stranger, to love the stranger. And I think that is so telling because maybe it's human nature to be suspicious of someone you don't know. And it's like God is reminding us to try and, you know, tamp down that suspicion which can lead so easily to hatred and, and abuse and instead reach out with compassion. And I think that's the message that Eva was preaching, and I think the, the players really got that. Um, did you sense that the players made a connection to Eva's message and, you know, the state of the world today, the struggles and the challenges that we have in today's world? You have to understand the players and the power of the connection that Eva made. This four foot two inch, 80 plus woman with these strapping 19, 20, 21 year old college athletes. What's gonna happen as a result of her experience with them is they're gonna tell their future spouses, they're gonna share it with their children, they're gonna share it at family dinners. And you say, well, what, what, what's important about that? Well, so you know, some of the people on the screen that you saw Bates Jones, his brother is Daniel Jones, the quarterback of the New York Giants. Oh, cool. Okay. Cal Freundlich, his mother is Julianne Moore, the famous actress. Oh, that's cool. Thing. Kellen Grady, uh, after he graduated from Davidson, went to Kentucky and played at Kentucky. Mike Jones, after he graduated from Davidson, went to grad school and is now playing at Stanford. So you, you're seeing people who uh, are going to have a, a wide net to impact, to connect. And they're gonna certainly connect Eva as someone that in a, a Catholic's terminology was an angel. She was an absolute angel to all of us. And as I said, she's a hero to me, but it was almost as if God had sent her and sent us there to make that connection so his message can be further delivered. Coach, there was one time in the video where I, I started to cry, and it was when your son, you know, saw the, the blouse and imagined your granddaughter being one of the victims um, in Auschwitz. How did that make you feel? Uh, I think tears are a gift from God. I, I'm convinced about that. And I have no hesitation whatsoever to cry, and I've done that in front of my children, and they've done that in front of me for the right reasons. Uh, forgive me for getting personal, but my dad, as I said, a New York City cop. His precinct was the 101st precinct, Mott Street in Far Rockaway. Far Rockaway was famous for two different kind of communities, the black community and the Jewish community. And I'm a seven, eight-year-old, nine-year-old boy and my father would bring me into the station house, the precinct, and he walked the beat with his billy stick and me in his hand, one hand. Mm -hmm. And I'd meet Jewish people and I'd meet black people. And they were all friendly to my father. What message was I getting? What connection was being given to me? And I think that's part of why I've been connected to the, the Jewish cause because of what my father did for me when I was seven, eight years old. And I think you're going to see that with my son now, with his own children, as he demonstrated the tears in his eyes and the, the impact that the experience had for him. Yeah, that's, that's the empathy that you're talking about. Doctors Gallon and Caleb, in making the film, you instructed the camera people to not record the players at certain times. Uh, when and why? Um, so... The reason, okay, so um, when we met Eva, we knew she was very special. We knew that she took um, a group of people every year to Auschwitz, and we wanted to make sure that we amplified her message. 
So um, we said, well, okay, how can we do this? And this, you know, what can we do? How can we figure this out? What is the best way we can amplify her message? Um, Amanda told me, Amanda is a Davidson graduate. She told me how amazing Davidson was. I thought she was making it up, right? I thought she was one of those people who, you know, went to a college, said this college is great. You know, she drank the Kool-Aid. I will be the first person to tell you I was wrong. Davidson is as great as she told me. The people who go there are special. I think you can see that, right? Um, she said, "She said we're going to call Coach McKillop. Um, how many? Well, what? Can you remember the exact timeline of events for when we called?" Um, I reached out to Coach McKillop. I reached out to Karen first, actually, uh, Coach's daughter, who I graduated with, and said, "Do you think I could reach out to your dad? Because we have this idea." And she said, "Do it." Um, and I think it was April. Um, it was it was a very short turnaround because we were in Auschwitz the beginning of July. Yes, it was right around July fourth is when we left. So it was yeah, a quick turnaround. Um, so that just goes to show you um, how enthusiastic Coach was and the entire team because he didn't tell them you have to go. Right, he would not do that. Um, we so had to get the NCAA approval. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was probably the thing that took the longest. Right. Um, so you know the whole team is incredibly enthusiastic about going, and we said this is great. And, you know how are we going to film this? How are we going to make this happen? Um, and this is something that actually was mentioned in your book, which we, we, you know, we appreciate. We wanted as many people to see this video as possible, right? Because that was our goal, was to amplify um, her message. Um, and, but uh, that being said, more important than that was to make sure that these players were experiencing what it was like to be in Auschwitz, in Birkenau, with Eva. So... Um, we had kind of a deal that was one of us would stay at the front, one of us would stay in the back because there was always a couple of players that needed some extra time to process. Um, and we basically said, listen, if, if someone is, is, you know, having a moment where they're really experiencing something or, you know, they're overly emotional, you can tell um, that they're really going through something, that's their time. You know, that, that's, that's their moment, that's their private time, that's the time they need to be processing. Um, and that is not a time to be captured on camera. Um, that is not a time to exploit what they're going through. That is a time to respect what they're going through. And um, that was a time for one of us to hang back in case they needed us. We, I think both of us felt very maternal on that trip, very much like we needed to protect them, protect their experience. Um, we still keep in touch with them. Um, we still very, feel very close to them, very protective of them, of this experience, of this team. Um, we would love to take other people to Auschwitz. I don't think there will ever be another group that, you know, has the same impact uh, on us that, that this group did. Um, so that was kind of how we, we approached this. It wasn't something we spoke about ahead of time. Right. It was just something that just you know, came naturally and seemed seemed like like the obvious way to approach it. And I, th I think I just want to, yeah. you said it so eloquently, but I just want to add it. It was about respecting the player's dignity. Um, that That's really, you know, there's there's the opportunity to amplify a message and also, as Stacey said, respecting the time they need to process and the time we needed to process too. I think we all were going through various um, emotional experiences and, and how the players supported each other, supported us. We were able to support them. But I, I think I want to emphasize that. It's really about Dignity. If we're going to talk about respecting dignity, we had to show that to the players as well. That's you have to model it, absolutely. Yeah. And there was a point where I remember I, uh, there was one point where I broke down, mm -hmm. and Cal Freundlich came over and just wrapped me up in a hug because um, it goes both ways. You know, um, it, it goes both ways, and, and it was an experience that we all had together, um, and it bonded all of us. And and I think and it will always bond all of us, just like like you were saying, Coach. You know, um, years down the line is something that we'll always talk about. We'll always have that experience. Um, and again, you know, when I found out that you were writing this this book, I felt so lucky and so grateful that this story would continue to be shared because it was such a wonderful experience. Um, and I just was, was so appreciative, um, you know, of what you guys were doing. Yeah. Um and isn't it true, Cal? You mentioned Cal. Didn't he write the music for the that he was playing did, yeah. for the video? Cal was the Maimonides Institute's first um, student emerging scholar because um, he is very into music. In fact, I'm pretty sure that just maybe in the past week or two, Cal's first 
album dropped. Um, I, th- I want to say it's called Happiness, but don't quote me on that. <laughs> um, and, you know, he was, Cal is um, multi-talented. So Cal, Cal spends a lot of time writing. He spends a lot of time journaling. You, you, can, you could see that he was writing things. He wrote poetry. Um, and, and that's, you know, he wanted to write. He wanted to do, to do music. And he said, you know, like, I want to write something. And I said, hey, Cal, do you, do you want to do this? Um, do you want to be the emerging scholar? Do you want to write some music for this? Um, and he said yes. And we were very pleased to have him. Again, just, you know, it becomes that much more personal. Right. So, yeah, one of right. the tracks in this film was written and produced by Cal. That's terrific. Um, I have one last question, Dr. Gallen, for you. In the introduction to the book, um, uh, it talks about uh, a new, sort of a new organization, College Athletes for Respect and Equality, or CARE, C-A-R-E. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so, um, as I said, we all formed close relationships on this trip, um, and... One of the people that I spent a long time with on the trip was Kellen Green. Um, Kellen comes from a background uh, where his family was very big in social justice um, in South Africa. Kellen and Eva and I, uh, the first day we got there, had had lunch together. Um, And I kind of felt just from talking to him that social justice was something that was important to him. And then one day, that one day he was, he was gonna wanna do something. This experience seemed to resonate with him. Um, and um, after, um, after George Floyd was murdered, uh, he and I had been in touch and he wanted to do something. He wanted to make some type of a difference and use his platform. So he contacted me, um, and we said, you know, let's, let's, let's do something. We talked for a long time. We spent a long time talking, and we came up with this. Um, it's not its own organization. It falls under the Maimonides Institute, but it's, it was, it's called College Athletes for Respect and Equality. Uh, the idea being that college athletes have a platform. Um, and, you know, he's been interviewed several times, and he'll tell you that the idea for this, knowing that he could make a difference, came from his trip uh, and came from Eva. And so um, we started this, this organization so that college athletes who wanted to do something but didn't have the tools or didn't know how to do it would have a place to kind of do this. And, and again, the goal being to promote um, equality, justice, and tolerance. Um, look, I can only speak for myself and, and my organization. As you said earlier, there's a lot of organizations uh, represented here um, tonight. But speaking personally on behalf of the Maimonides Institute, um, I'm obviously very troubled by the fact that, you know, athletes have a, a platform, whether or not they want to admit that they do, they have a platform, right? Um, and what they say impacts uh, a lot of people, particularly young people. Um, and that platform can be good, can be used for good or for evil. Um, I could sit here, right, and I could, I could say a lot of negative things and, and I could place blame. Um, but um, in the spirit of Eva, I don't really think that that's really helpful. Instead, uh, what, I, what I'd rather do is just say that it's really important to shine light on the good that sports can do and to write and read books like the one that Graham and Jerry wrote. Uh, it's really important to help athletes understand that they have a platform. Um, it's really important to give them the tools to understand how to use that platform. It's really important to emphasize the importance of human dignity. Um, it's really important to emphasize empathy. It's really important to have leaders uh, and coaches who emphasize that it's more important to be a winner off the court than it is on the court. Um, and it's up to us, like the people sitting on this stage who all gave their time and their effort and sacrificed being there for their son's first game as a head coach to be here to give this message and to make sure that these lessons continue to be passed down. Um, and 
so I kind of put this out there. Uh, and and it, at this point, I am going to speak for everybody on the stage. And I'm sorry, but I hope that's OK. Um, like we're here to show that and to show the importance of like the goodness in the world and the goodness of sports and the goodness of human dignity and promoting equality and justice and tolerance. And we hope that people get something out of that, right? Like, I think that's why you guys wrote the book. Um, I hope people buy the book. I hope people read the book. I hope people see how amazing the book is. I hope people see what the power that a coach can have on people's lives, not just you know on whether or not a program you know is successful or not. I hope people understand that like there's just so much that can be done. There's just so much that we can do to impact the next generation. Um, and as I said, I'm the only Jew up here right now. You know what I mean? It's not about that. It, it's about working together and and using our shared experiences to promote tolerance and justice. And equality, um, and we need that now more than ever. And I think that's what recent events needs to teach us. So I guess that's my little spiel. Sorry, but sorry to you know get on my little soapbox, but no, that's okay. Preach. <laughs> <laughs> uh, before we wrap up, I just want to offer any of our pa panelists to just offer a final comment, final thought. Oh, Jerry, okay. <laughs> I, I feel by far the most downstream from that trip, from Eva, <clears throat> from everything we've, we've discussed tonight. Um, but as I mentioned, kind of from the outset, what drew me in was the possibility that athletics could make a big difference. Even just one person, Stacy told us a story about sharing that video overseas and having one person come up afterwards and talk to her. Um, I, I do think that makes a difference. Um, I was thinking before, I, I was taking a run, I thought, I didn't, we didn't get these questions ahead of time. I didn't know what this was going to look like. I thought, well, I should have one thing ready to say. Um, so I went out for a run. When I walk out my front door, I look to the left. There's a synagogue. When I hit my point where I turn around on the run, uh, there's a Catholic church. Uh, and I thought about, that's exactly how the book is structured. We started with Eva. We ended with Sister Jean. Uh, at Loyola Chicago, who is now 103, 102, 103. And I thought it kind of played out just so nicely. The whole thrust of the book um, is what can happen to athletics if you open it up to other voices, other ideas, to these two elderly, wonderful women who we sat and listened to and followed them. Um, and athletics was the way that we got there. Um, but where they were going, where they've taken people, is kind of the pure, more important message. Um, so I just, being way downstream, still feel deeply moved and affected by one of these people who I never met, Eva, and another who we had, did have the fortune to meet, and Sister Jean, um, and what they were both, as far as I can see, kind of driving at and getting us to see and learn and remember and pass on. I, I think for me, my, my final thought, um, first of all, one of the interesting things about the book is you, you want to have a strong opening and a strong close. And originally, we were going to open with Sister Jean, this uplifting story. Is, is everybody familiar with Sister Jean? Show of hands. Okay. So again, she's, she's a 102-year-old chaplain at Loyola of Chicago and made quite a name for herself when Loyola went to the Final Four in 2018. She, we refer to her as the first lady of college basketball in the book. And originally, we were leading with Sister Jean, her story. And um, we ultimately decided we have to lead with the, the story on, on Davidson and Auschwitz. And of course, there's a little bit of guilt. I mean, who's bumping Sister Jean to the back of the book? <laughs> but it, it was so important for us. But the, I guess the, the takeaway I have is I hope there are coaches that read this. It, I can't emphasize enough how unique it is what Davidson did. Um, I don't know of another example quite like it. I've been around college basketball my entire life. I've been about around some great coaches, but the focus, so much of it, is on you know how do you get better on the court? How do you have better players? How do you create better teams? College programs are allowed to go overseas every four years. 
uh, to play yeah. against teams, right. uh, semi-pro teams, pro teams, and a lot of them oh, do it. Okay. My so, one hope you know, is that please. there will be other coaches like who read, hopefully read this book or hear about the Davidson story and say, you know, we need to take that trip, but, but perhaps not focus and worry so much on basketball. There was a line we felt really, really important to share in the book is that the Davidson players never touched a basketball on that trip. And that was so important for us to have in. So for me, it was an honor participating in this. I hope I was really worried when I saw Coach McKillop in the lobby to get his reaction on the book, but I hope we've done the Davidson story justice and, and the story of Eva Poor and, and this trip to Auschwitz justice. I, I tell our players all the time, the two greatest gifts we have are time and love. Think about those two gifts in your life. You've given them to us up here tonight. Not you have given them to me. Thank you. But honestly, the thing is, I'm not, it's not like I, I didn't blast I can't say anything better than that. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, that's it. So uh, I'm just, I'm so fortunate. You know, As I said, my son was here a couple of days ago. He became a bar mitzvah. Um, there was heightened security. And I spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, what do I do? You know, what's happening in our world? What about, you know, I thought about Eva and her situation, kind of how there were people, you know, obviously who perished and weren't able to have their bar bat mitzvahs. Is that the world we're moving towards? How do I fix it? What do I do? But I'm sitting here now with these people, and it gives me hope, right? Um, and I think as long as we have hope, we're doing okay. So um, I hope you leave here with some hope. Um, and I just want to say thank you. Um, wow, I have to close this out. Um, I, I'm struck by um, thinking about the people who come into your life and, and how they shape who you are and how you shape them. And I, and I think back to, to 1998 when I stepped foot on Davidson's campus as a field hockey player. And if you had asked that 18-year-old self, would I be here right now? I don't think in my wildest imagination I would have ended up here at this moment. But I think of, of you know meeting Coach McKillop and having a relationship with him, meeting Stacy, meeting Jan Graham and Jerry more recently. But the people who come into your lives um, and and how they impact how you see the world and how you want to do good by them. So I just that's a long way of saying I'm really grateful to be sharing the stage with such amazing people who want to do good in the world. Um, and it inspires me to want to do more good in the world and to live Eva's message. And I hope all of you feel the same way after seeing the documentary tonight. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so Eva met with the Davidson basketball team in 2018 at Auschwitz, and Eva passed away in 2019, correct? Correct. So, uh, Eva Moses Kor, Zichronali Vracha, may her memory be for a blessing. We all know that in Jewish tradition, um, people don't truly, really die as long as we keep them alive in our memories, as long as we honor the values that they honored. And you've heard each of the panelists tonight basically preach Eva's message. And now it is up to us, literally it is up to us, to leave this sanctuary tonight and make sure that we are living the values that Eva lived. Values of compassion, values of respect for all people, value of forgiveness, and love and positivity. If we can all just take that message with us tonight, we really can make this world, which sometimes seems seems dark and cold, we really can make it the place that it is supposed to be. Eva is a reminder that it is our responsibility to do that. It is not a choice. It is our responsibility to live that kind of life, the kind of life that she lived. Again, may her memory be for a blessing. Uh, I want to thank so much all five of our guests tonight, uh, Jerry and Graham, Coach McKillop, Dr. Gallen, Dr. Caleb. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you so much. Oh, and by the way, Coach, uh, Ari told me that uh, Davidson trounced whoever they were playing tonight. So Matt did just fine. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> I, were they playing? Was it Guilford College? All right, I didn't see who it was. All right, it was Guilford College. So don't worry, they took care of business. They took care of business. Okay, so look, everyone, thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, what we're going to do now is you can go out in the lobby and please buy a copy of the book. The book will support the partnership between the proceeds, I should say, will support the partartnership between Marlboro Jewish and the Maimonides Institute um, so that we can continue to do pro